Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Ozanek and welcome to Destination Michigan. We have quite the journey in store for you today. It'll take us from sandy shores to snow-capped peaks. We'll make a few new friends and even travel back in time. So without further ado, let's take a sneak peek at what we have coming up. Stephanie Mills heads to Boyne City and takes us inside the workshop at Shaggy's Copper Country Skis. Steve Smith searches for adventure on Power Island and heads to the Le Chineau Antique Wooden Boat Show in Hessel. In Harbor Springs, we'll learn about the rise and fall of the historic Great Lakes steamships and peak fall colors demand a visit to the Goodhart General Store in Emmett County. Settle in because our Destination Michigan adventure starts right now. Skiing is a beloved winter pastime here in Michigan, especially for the Thompson family of Boyne City. Skiing has been in the family's blood for generations, and their legacy is carving corduroy on mountains across Michigan and the world. Stephanie Mills kicks off today's episode with a visit to Shaggy's Copper Country Skis. We're a big ski family. One day I said, I'm gonna make a ski bike. I'm gonna put skis on an old bike frame that we had, and I'm gonna go out and take it down the hill. At that point, you know, kind of looked at what was in it. I hadn't really put a lot of thought into what's in a ski before that point. I said, wow, oh, like, I think we can make this. Meet Jeff Thompson, founder and partner of Shaggy's Copper Country Skis. They're located right in the heart of Boyne City. Born into a family of experimenters and entrepreneurs, it's safe to say the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Jeff, alongside his dad, John, and their awesome crew, make every pair of their custom shaggy skis right here in their warehouse for skiers with any type of skill level. We have a, a number of different shapes. Um, we've got 11 different models that go for everything from skiing on hard pack and groomers to um, deep powder. You know, kind of our, our flagship ski is our, our Ami Klein. It's a ski that's super versatile. You can take it out in just about any type of snow condition and have a ton of fun. Um, they're great for going off, off piste and, and adventuring. And that's, like I said, it, it's our flagship model. The Thompsons have a long history in the sport. They're the fourth generation now to embrace it. In fact, the name Shaggy also has its roots in the family's history. My great grand uncle Shaggy, he carved skis in the Keweenaw Peninsula and he carved them for you know numerous different people but he carved a pair for my grandma and when we were getting started in making skis found this pair of skis asked my dad like, what are these all oh, these are your grandmother's skis and uncle shaggy carved them for her and she used to ski down the rock piles on them and cross country ski with them and all sorts of stuff up in the copper country Copper Country, a sacred part of the Upper Peninsula encompassing the entire Keweenaw Peninsula where skiing in remote areas is alive and well. The lifestyle of backcountry skiing is infused into every pair of skis handcrafted at Shaggy's along with some personal motivations. So, you know, we've got our, our actual family and then we've got the Shaggy's family, you know, which first kind of starts out as like, people that you know work for us are everyone that's a that's a craftsman you know you have to be a craftsman to work here um, because we're not just tossing parts together it's a lot of you know there's a human factor in everything um, and we're building you know building custom skis so everyone's got to pay a lot of attention but we're all here for a passion the Shaggy's family's grown you know it's, it's not just us it's it's all of our customers it's it's unique I think the the biggest part is that um, you can have a pair of skis made for you, and uh, they're specifically for them. We do it all, from going uh, from a pile of wood to shipping out to a customer. The Shaggy's team has their work cut out for them, turning piles of lumber into skis for their customers. We cut it up into a bunch of little strips, and every little piece of, uh, of wood, so it's a six foot long strip that's about five eighths of an inch thick and an inch wide, will be flex every board, every one of those little strips to make sure that we know that we're gluing those pieces back together in a symmetrical fashion. And there's a whole lot more that goes into creating these works of art right here in Northern Michigan, including more cutting, shaving, 
and even testing them in the snow before they're off to their new home. They want to make sure you love them as much as they love making them. How does it make you feel to be a part of all of this? Proud, you know, of all the things that, uh, that we've done. We've worked really hard to get here. We're passionate about skiing and if we can share that passion, for me, that's, you know, that's everything. If you slid downhill and you have a smile at the bottom, that's all that counts. It takes the team about six hours to make one pair of skis. They carry pre-made skis in their store, but always welcome custom designs to make them one of a kind. This season on Destination Michigan, our very own Steve Smith will be taking us on an island hopping adventure across the Great Lakes. His first stop takes us to West Grand Traverse Bay, where we'll find serenity to soothe the soul on Power Island. To quote Shakespeare, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Boaters, hikers, and campers would agree. Whatever the moniker, Power Island is an outdoor enthusiast's dream. Power Island uh, used to be called uh, Marion Island. It was named Marion Island in uh, 1883. The owner, Frederick Hall, a timber speculator in Ionia, Michigan, bought the island for its timber, petitioned the state legislature to name it uh, Marion Island in uh, honor of his daughter. And then she, uh, Marion, uh, eventually inherited it. Kept it until 1917 when uh, she put it up for sale and Henry Ford bought the island. The locals started calling it Ford Island, of course. Power Island remains much as it was when it was first created by glaciers 10 to 12,000 years ago. Fred Tank has been caretaker of the island for 34 years. The story is that Henry Ford was here visiting his uh, sister in his yacht and had Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone with him and they explored the island and that's when uh, Marion was uh, trying to sell the island so he bought it at that time but never did anything with it. The local people expected a, a mansion to be built out here. Thank God it didn't happen. He owned it but really didn't do anything with it and ultimately uh, sold it in the early 40s I think it was. Legend has it that Babe Ruth and other notables flocked to frolic with Ford and his friends. The ownership of the island changed hands several times after Ford sold it, and each time the threat of private development was a concern. That's when Eugene and Sadie Power stepped up and donated $250,000 to the Nature Conservancy to purchase the island and ensure it would remain a preserve for all to enjoy. A small number of people really come onto the island and use the trails for camping, exploring. We've got lots of different habitats, six, over six miles of uh, nature trails, lots of different places to go, places you can go and be ball by yourself all day long, even though it's only 212 acres. And then besides that, we have a picnic area, which is where we are now, picnic tables and grills, nice swimming beaches, so people can picnic and do, enjoy it that way. We have two different campgrounds with five sites each that people enjoy a lot. Bassett Island is, is um, pretty unique because it's just a small two-acre island attached to the big island, Power Island. And then we have a, a campground on the south shore with five sites and some really popular places. On a sunny summer day, Power Island is ringed with hundreds of boats as people drop anchor to socialize and relax. Flash back to the early 1900s when Ford's yacht plied the waters of West Grand Traverse Bay. Others took a ferry for a quarter to the islands to dance the night away. At one time, under certain owners, it, it had like a speakeasy out there and, and people would go and, and dance at the dance hall. This is in the 1900s, I believe, the early 1900s. Today, Power and Bassett Islands are part of the Grand Traverse County Park System. Hiking the trails on Power transports you back in time in a way few destinations can. We have old shorelines from 6,000 years ago, from 2,500 years ago, clearly visible. Places where, where you can see this was the beach. It, now it's 25 feet or 50 feet uh, above the present lake level, but you can see where the beach was back then. Fred's a lucky guy, and he doesn't take his surroundings for granted. Power Island is where he and his wife raised their family, and he cares for the land like it's his own. 
this is pretty primitive and one of my goals for the years that I've been here is not to change things much, if anything. <laughs> I don't want any aluminum signs out here. <laughs> I want it to stay the way it's been, it's always been. And it, it is just the way it's been. You wouldn't know now from 30, 40, 50, 70 years ago, it's the same. Keep an eye out for Steve's next island adventure as he makes the journey to Drummond Island in Lake Huron. For our next story, we're paying a visit to the Harbor Springs Historical Society. There, we'll take a look back at the legacy of the mighty and massive Great Lakes steamships that brought visitors to northern Michigan at the turn of the 20th century. And as you'll soon see, it was unlike any experience you'll find today. For those residing in cities like Chicago and St. Louis at the turn of the 20th century, day-to-day -day life meant being surrounded by a massive industrial engine. People craved a respite from the constant drumming and droning of a rapidly modernizing world. So they turned their eyes north, lining up on docks by the hundreds, leaving behind the big city bound for the small resort town of Harbor Springs. They daydreamed about splashing in the cool waters of Little Traverse Bay and filling their lungs with air untarnished by the byproducts of industrialization. Beginning as early as oh, 1893 uh, with the steamship Manitou was one of the first steamships that had a line specifically coming from Chicago up to Harbor Springs and that was about a 20 hour to 24 hour trip. Honestly, it wasn't that much different from today's cruise ships. So there were staterooms where you could stay the night, um, there were dining rooms, there were smoking rooms, there were grand salons, and of course there were the decks. You know, there would be three or four decks for passengers where you could go out to see and be seen, almost like a promenade. Everybody would circle around the decks and, and you know, you'd go for a walk in your best outfit so that other people could see you looking awesome. None of them could have imagined that these trips would birth traditions that would span generations. But while they swam, danced, and went on their merry way, that's exactly what was happening. To understand the complete history of the steamships, we first have to talk about railroads. Rail lines like the Grand Rapids in Indiana had built a massive infrastructure of railroads to reach timber in northern Michigan. As time went on, they were faced with a dilemma. Eventually, the timber tributaries ran out, and they still had all of these rail lines, and they had to figure out how to make them profitable again. And the way they decided to do that was to bring tourists up here. The rail lines specifically funded a lot of the steamships to come up here. So you could take, for example, a train to Chicago, get on a steamship, come to Harbor Springs, and then take another one of their trains to some of the other stations throughout Michigan. They also built a number of the large hotels. For example, the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island was funded by transportation companies, specifically because they wanted people to come up north on their rail lines. So how do you get people up there? You build a gigantic hotel and market it as a tourist attraction. It was kind of what I would call the first pure Michigan campaign. Come up to the north, get out of the dirty cities, the industrial areas, and they claimed that it could cure hay fever and asthma, that it was just good for your health in general to come up here. The plan worked. Northern Michigan quickly became a magnet for vacationers, and not strictly for those with pockets full of cash. I think it was probably around three to five dollars, depending on if you wanted a stateroom for the night, if you were going to be having dinner as well, if you were a first class passenger or a second class passenger. It just sort of depended, but really, you know, about five bucks would get you there. They wanted to be affordable for people to be able to actually use that transit. They didn't want it to be just for the elite. They wanted the everyday family to be able to escape from the suburbs of Chicago and come up here for the summer. And so it was, it was fairly affordable. And there was also, uh, we have a wonderful artifact um, from the steamship Manitou from 1897 that shows you could go from Harbor Springs to Mackinac for just a dollar. It was a day trip excursion if you wanted to take a little trip on the steamship up that way. A steamship arriving at the dock in Harbor Springs was a sight to behold, but people weren't there just to ooh and ah at the towering steamers. It was almost like a red carpet. You know, when you were traveling, you didn't just wear, you know, something comfy to travel in. You wore something that you wanted to be seen in because when you got off that dock, there might be photographers, there might be people um, writing for the newspapers, and they would, especially the newspapers back then, would catalog every single person who came in and what their business was. Mrs. Duell is visiting Mrs. Abbott for, you know, a week and then going back to Chicago for business. It, it was all written down. 
um, and, and so you wanted to make a good impression. But the party didn't last forever. In 1915, a new law was passed saying the railroad companies could no longer operate steamships in order to break up the monopoly they had on transportation. While that slowed the steamship business, its true death nail would come in the form of four wheels and an engine. It didn't really stop things um, until sort of the advent of the automobile and the idea of taking your family for an adventure to the north meant you could drive there yourself and there was something sort of pioneering about being able to do that that slowly but surely the, the passenger steamships were no longer needed. While the Historical Society's collection contains artifacts from the ships, there's also a wealth of correspondence. Letters and postcards sent back to the cities with tales from a paradise in the north. And their words are still echoed today by those who seek adventure and serenity in northern Michigan. I think that it you know, there's a direct line between those early steamships and the passengers who came to our resort areas and the people who are coming now. You know, the things that they're talking about are the same things we talk about now. They talk about how when they first arrived here, they were taken away by the breathtaking beauty of Little Traverse Bay and the clear water and, and forests. And, uh, and I, I think it's neat to think that someone like me who would have been traveling here in the 1890s might have been coming here for the same reason, coming up here to, to really experience what the North was like. If you'd like to learn more about these ships and the rich history of the Harbor Springs area, the Harbor Springs Historical Society is ready and waiting to field your questions and fuel your curiosity. Not far from Harbor Springs, there's a small red building nestled along the side of M119. The Goodhart General Store has been a staple in downtown Goodhart for generations. We recently made a visit during the fall color season to experience this roadside gem in the heart of Emmett County. The Goodhart General Store was built in 1934 by its original owner, Cliff Powers. It was much more than just a spot for local residents to pick up their bread and milk. In a town as small as Goodhart, the store has served multiple roles over the years as the gas station, the butcher shop, and in 1934, it became Goodhart's post office, and still is to this day. In 1971, Cliff passed the store along to Carolyn, and now, all these years later, she is still at the helm, helped along by her husband, Jim, and a friendly staff. And if it's 10 o'clock at night, and you need an ice cream fix, you go to the store. So I think that's really the story of the store. It's Absolutely. always been that. Cliff had it that way, we've continued it, Cliff told me when I bought the store, he said, you're responsible for this town. You probably have places in your mind that stick out from when you were six or seven. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they say that you can't go back, but we try to make this, you can. Many original features of the store remain intact, such as the glass front counters and the post boxes where past and current residents grab their correspondence. While visitors peruse the shelves filled with Michigan-made goods and youngsters eyeball the cabinet full of cookies, memories are being made by the handful. And according to current owner, Carolyn Sutherland, that's exactly what the store is all about. This is, this is the real memory maker because you can't, you can't find this anywhere anymore. This is my childhood. I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm living my constant childhood, which is not bad. We have house chargers. So like the people that come up, the kids can come up and they charge on mom's charge. I mean, that's a, they can't do that anywhere else down where they live, where they can just walk up the road from through the woods and climb over and come in and get an ice cream and sit out here. We have tons of kids out here in the summertime, which is, it's a lifestyle that you can't duplicate. Probably other places like this, but when they go back home and they go to the suburbs or the city, this is a great memory. This place is about making memories. As Carolyn and Jim greet the day's customers, it's easy to see that the true spirit of the Little Red Building lives in the relationships and memories that have been built inside its walls. Cutest thing that ever happened. Well, there's a ton of them. But we had closed. It was after closing, and we sat out here. We were all sitting, a bunch of us were sitting out here. And these four or five teenagers came up, girls. Oh, you're closed? Mm-hmm. What'd you want? An ice cream. And they looked so pathetic, I thought, oh, geez. So I got up, I said, all right, come with me. And I opened the door, I took them back into the kitchen. I said, there's the ice cream, there's the scoops, there's the cones. And they looked at me and said, hey, after hours, I don't wait on you. 
So they scooped their ice cream, and all the time they walked, they didn't know me. They looked at me and I said, hey, you can't pay, we're closed, you gotta go now. They went home and told their parents who came out the next day and said, they'll never forget that. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much the community depends on the store, which makes me very happy. The school bus stops here and lets the kids off. You know, you go to the store. And that's the story of Good Heart. You go to the store. The Good Heart General Store is open year round, so be sure to stop in and grab a slice or an amazing homemade pot pie. Next up, it's off to the picturesque and quiet lakefront community of Hessel on Lake Huron in the Eastern UP. This sleepy village becomes a bustling destination each August when the Les Cheneaux Antique Wooden Boat Show comes to town. Steve Smith brings us today's final story. A glorious summer day brought people by the hundreds to the upper peninsula town of Hessel for the Les Cheneaux Antique Wooden Boat Show. It's a conundrum of classy crisscrafts, kayaks, and characters. I've been volunteering for 20 years. Safe spot up by the Islander Bar. I love it and I'm looking forward for next year. 124 boats were on display for the 42nd annual event that began in 1978. And people come from far and wide to ooh and ah at the classic and classy crafts. We have a lot of wooden boats in the islands. A third of the boats for the show come from the islands, but they all, uh, they're runabouts, utilities, launches, canoes, kayaks, outboards. We have a 19 different classes of boats at this show. Most everyone agrees it's the polished wood, power, and panache that makes these boats a maritime memory. Oh, the varnish, <laughs> the, the, the heritage of them, the sounds of them. Even though some of them are the same class boat, and say make, they're all different. They all have different qualities and they're all gorgeous. All my attraction to antique boats goes back to a young man working on a commercial fish boat in the Eagle River chain in Wisconsin. And the wealthy people from Milwaukee and Green, uh, in Chicago driving the classic boats and the chrome and the varnished wood. They were so unique and distinctive and different and so uh, as life progressed, I started collecting woody cars and got a bit tired of the same look of the woody cars and got into the antique boats because of the disparity of design and, uh, and it's just a general attractiveness of them. Well, this is a one-off custom design, John Hacker, Belle Isle Bearcat. Built in 1929 for a client that hired, wanted John Hacker to design it but wanted Belle Isle to build it. And so it's a unique boat, it's a one of a kind, 33 foot, powered by a Liberty aircraft engine. The Liberty aircraft engine is 1917, 450 horse, two spark plugs per cylinder. Of course, it was built by Belle Isle, located on Jefferson Avenue in downtown Detroit. I've had a couple of people tell me if a gangster didn't own it, he should have. And if a classic Chris Craft isn't in your budget, you might consider a wooden kayak. Or, for a few hundred bucks, they can even outfit you in a mini wooden boat. I could say I've owned 75 wooden boats. There's not many people can say they had owned 75 wooden boats. These works of art take up to six hours for each board to dry, or about six months from start to finish. And the detail makes them exact replicas of their real sisters. I buy any recyclable uh, mahogany I can find from old boats, old furniture, uh, and I buy recycled plywood that comes in from Fremont where they build baby food. They get juice in plywood boxes and they have eighth inch thick plywood, so I use that. So I try to recycle as much as I can. The Les Cheneaux Antique Wooden Boat Show is held each August. It's another national jewel tucked away in Michigan's Upper Peninsula that highlights the heritage of Hessel. But what makes it special in my mind is the long-term historic commitment to classic boats that this area has, going back to Murtaugh Marine, which was the oldest Chris Craft dealer in the nation and has been uh, was given the Chris Craft dealership before any other dealerships in the nation, and then the breadth and scope of the antique boats that still ply the waters of the Leshno Islands in Lake Michigan. Mark your calendars for the second weekend in August to enjoy the splendor of these breathtaking boats. And just like that, this episode of Destination Michigan has come to a close. From everyone here, thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.